it back over to Josh. Thank you, Mike. Get my water out of here so our next guest doesn't accidentally drink it. <laughs> All right, our next guest, he is actually one of my favorite speakers, to be honest. I uh, first saw him speak. Matter of fact, the first time I saw him speak was on my show. Uh, I, I remember Mike and Jeannie, they were asking me to um, have some of the speakers on. And this is, I just want to tell you, one of the things I love about this conference not all the speakers agree on everything. And to me, that makes it a great conference. That's what iron sharpening iron means. When they said, come let us reason together, that means, hey, we're all a little off, let's perfect this deal. And the fact that Mike and Jeannie have a conference like that, love it. But when I first heard our next guest speak, I had him on the show, I'm like, wow, this guy's, this guy's smart. So I, I really liked what he had to say. First time I saw him here, I really liked what he had to say. And I know if you have not heard him yet, you're in for a treat. Dr. Michael Lake, our next speaker, is the founder. Wait, wait, wait. You can just hold on a second. He gets a better introduction than just my testimony, right? As if that wasn't enough. Our next speaker is the founder and chancellor of Bible Life College and Seminary, host of Bible Life TV, and co-host of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing Podcast with his wife, Mary Lou. He is the author of the best-selling books, the Shinar, Sh I always mess this up, Shinar <sighs> Directive. And why are you always on the days that I have to announce you? Like last time it was the same thing. I can't get like, whatever. I think you do. <laughs> and the, what's the next one then? See, it's not that easy, is it? <laughs> the Sharif Imperative. Please help me welcome Dr. Michael Lake. First of all, we need to call security. Somebody stole 20 minutes off my timer. Are you guys enjoying the conference? You know, one of the things, and then on some of these we actually, are, we speakers get to share with one another every once in a while. And what's so neat is every single speaker here I have immense respect for. That they walk with the Lord, that they've paid a price for where they are. And we, we don't have to agree on every point. Jesus will straighten us all out when we get up there. But each one of us have a piece of the puzzle. And there is, there is a wealth, there is a tapestry that God is putting together with this conference, and that's how you begin to move in kingdom. Now, I'm going to give a kingdom intelligence briefing today. And the first half of it, I'm going to call the poop head briefing because we're going to deal with what the enemy is doing, then I can get into kingdom. And how many listen to the kingdom intelligence briefing? Now, tell everybody why you listen to it. Mary Lou, right? Uh, I tried to do it for a year or so by myself, and the thing came alive when she came on. And we have so much fun together, and, and this, the, the, the anointing of God flows. But I really want to get in today on AI and the hive mind to begin with. And in the book of Revelation, he says, and he gave power, he had power to give life into the image of the beast. And we have pondered for quite a while what that's going to be. You know, and is, is it going to be an automaton? Is it going to be a robot? Is it going to be a hunk of mud? What is it going to be? And I'm going to try to get into that a little bit today of some possibilities of what it can be. And that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And no man could buy or sell or save he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now there's a lot of things that we can look at historically about the mark of the beast and, and this image of the beast. What's interesting is when you look at the... That wasn't supposed to be there. We're going to come back to that here in a minute. No? Before I get into this, I put, the, I put the images together this morning about 5 o'clock. 
One of the things the elite do, and this is one of the things that uh, I bring out in the Shadar Directive, whenever you deal with classified material, I'm, I'm ex-military, uh, you, you can have all the way up to top secret, everybody knows what top secret is. But what you don't realize is there are levels of security above top secret. One of them is called compartmentalization. And let's say that I and Josh Tolley are working on a specific project and it is above top secret and it is compartmentalized. When we're in that room working together, we can, we can talk about that. Now, we're given just a piece of the puzzle. We can talk about it openly. We're dealing with issues. The moment that we leave that room, even if we're talking to one another, what is in that room does not exist. Complete compartmentalization. And so one of the things the elite have done globally is they have all these different groups, sometimes even competing nations that are in, race, that are in uh, arms races, developing pieces of the puzzle, but they don't have the whole puzzle. They just have one component. It's only the ones behind the curtain that are pulling the strings that, have, that understand the full plan and how that this piece from Russia is going to fit with this piece from China as well as connect with this piece in America and that when we pull it all together, we will be able to do whatever we're planning to do. And as I begin to look at this, some of the things that we want, I want to look at today is, is a possibility of how the image of the beast is going to work and understanding what it is. And it's going, to, it's going to involve artificial intelligence. It's going to involve the hive mind. Anybody ever hear of the hive mind? Transhumanism and transhumanists are, are, is all about becoming human 2.0, 3.0, or whatever, whatever direction they're wanting to go. We hear a lot about 5G, quantum internet, Blockchain, anybody hear of blockchain? Okay, blockchain, one of the uses is going to be cryptocurrency. Okay, they're going to move toward that because you have to have that to have a universal currency. But what nobody's connected is blockchain is going to be instrumental for the universal ID. You're going to be blockchain. Okay, Internet of Things. How many of us have an iPhone, whatever? And that, that's an inter, that is a, a, a part of the things of the Internet, right? But once it's all networked, their plan is you're going to become an Internet of things. See, each piece is a piece of the puzzle. And when you, when you look at it, what's amazing, people like Elon Musk is, is saying, we don't want AI. I don't want anything to do with AI. AI, have, have you not watched sci-fi? We don't want to invent Skynet. We don't want to involve these things. But you know, his company may be actually developing pieces and the components that he doesn't think has anything to do with AI, that he's actually building part of their systems because he doesn't get to look behind the curtain. And so one of the things I want to do today is, from my viewpoint, is trying to figure out possibilities of how all these things can knit together. And when you do, you begin to see a picture that becomes a false God, a false body of Christ, a false Holy Spirit. And it's going to be a force to be reckoned with. I want you to think about that. On a planet that you can't hide, on a planet that you've been blockchained and you can't edit it, you can't escape from it, and you, you, you know, you can't do, like, do a facial recognition. You can shave your beard and you can put, you know, a little black hair and a little black hair and it messes it up and it can't recognize you. All that's going to be history pretty soon. We need to understand these things that are going on and what, with, with the threat that we have of AI. And let me tell you something. We're, there are a lot of us that are um, dealing with AI on a daily basis and you don't even know it. Did you know, for some of us, you call your credit card company, and that sweet little lady, you think, thank God I didn't get a computer. And man, she knows all about you. Well, Mr. Lake, we're, it's, it's been three months since we've, we've had any problems with you. How can we help you? I see you've done this and you've done that. There may not even be a human that I'm talking to. The computer, the moment that I called in the A, I pulled up my history of everything that's going on, and she, you know, how's your wife, Mary? All that's going on, and we think it's Barb down in Cincinnati. <laughs> you know, that's like the, the old days, you got somebody from India, and his name is John. 
You know, <laughs> you know well, at least now they're signing, you know, and they're getting put out of business because AI is taking over. AI is beginning to give business solutions that they're, they're, they're confessing. Listen, the top experts in the world can't figure this out. We ask an AI, and the AI gives a solution that no human would ever do, but when you do it, it works. That's where we're headed, and that's some of the things that we need to prepare ourselves for. Now, a lot of times the, in the old school when they would read the, the image of the beast, we, we would think of the old story of the golem that the rabbis talk about, and which is significant because you have God took mud, put it together, breathed life in it, and Adam lived. Okay, so there's this creation story of becoming God-like and creating. And so now man is saying, I'm going to create something in my image, yet it's going to be superior to me. And within, within Kabbalic legend, uh, part of it is, you know, they, there's different stories and it, it really varies. But one of them is, if you know how to say the tetragrammaton, you know, is it Yahweh, Yahovah, Yah, you know, uh, Yahweh, Jesus cleared it up for us. He said, call him Father. Because by the time Jesus came along, because of, of, the, word of uh, the name of God being so abused in Babylon, in fact, where we get the word Yahoo, was that the Jews were made fun of, and it so grieved them that they called them Yahoos, they quit saying the name. So the time we get to Jesus, they had quit saying the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Heh which encoded in, in, the, in the name is he is the God who will be revealed twice with a nailed hand. yod heh vav -Heh. And Jesus didn't pull him aside and say, let me show you the secret sauce. He said, believe in me, call him Father. And so sometimes a lot of the things, and, and how do we exactly when we say it, you know we're going to find out for absolutely sure when he shows up. And then we're going to know is we're going to, you know, we're going to look back at a lot of the arguments we have had over things, and we're going to say, I was still in kindergarten, it's like two kids fighting over a piece of candy. When there's bigger things, there are bigger fish to fry that we need to be involved with in the kingdom. How did I get off them? Okay. Oh, yeah. They would say the sacred name, and it would come to life. And part of that was saying if you let it live one day, it calls you master. You let it live two days, it calls you friend. You let it live three days, it calls you slave. And so that kind of goes in with the golem motif. But I, I think what, what we're seeing with AI, and that they have been very braggadocious about it. They're, they're looking for that singularity. That it becomes self-aware. And the very ones, and this gets me about atheists and scientists, they deny the God of the Bible. Yet they're constantly working on either creating a God or becoming one. <laughs> so why are you spending all your time trying to become or make what you deny exists? It's ridiculous. But they're driven to do it. There is a force behind them. And I want to look at a couple of slides if I can advance to the right ones here. An AI God will emerge by 2042 and will write its own Bible. Will you worship it? Now because of 5G, they have changed the date and Kurzweil has changed the date to 2030. At the same time, the UN has moved their 2020 thing to 2030. Everybody's going to 2030 like there's a bullseye on that date. And there's a lot of things that they're trying to put together. Here's another one. Des Ex Machina, former Google engineer, is developing an AI god. And it moves in mysterious ways. It does. It comes up with solutions that a human would never figure out. Here's another one. God to be replaced by AI, new religion to be created by computers. This, and, and you know, you go and you search this on Google, and I had millions of articles that I could have chose. These are just random that are on there. They're being quite blatant about it. Is AI a threat to Christianity? Let me tell you something. I don't care what AI that you build. 
He is no match for Almighty God. If God could have a bad day, the AI still would not have a chance. Come on now. Now, I'm going through a lot of this quickly because I want to get to the good stuff, okay? Let's, let's deal with what they're doing so that we can begin dealing with another one. There's some other things that I'm beginning to hear. They're talking about hive mind. I, I first became aware of this with some DARPA projects. They wanted to be able to give soldiers hive mind. That means they turn them into drones and they move as a single force with a guy back somewhere in Langley or whatever now in Denver because they moved everything that we found out at lunch today. Uh, they, the, the guy sat in their back with a joystick moving them in. In fact, there was, a, there was a series on TV for a while called Dial House, which dealt with MK Ultra, that kind of thing, kind of a little bit different version of it. And part of what they ended up having were these troops that were dolls that were taken out because they were ex-military, they were programmed with a hive mind, and the men had a hard time fighting the influence of the, of the overlord of the hive mind with what they're supposed to do. But what's interesting about this article that they bring out. Let me see if I can find the right page here. And this is from the article because humans, although they say it would be beneficial for humans to have hive minds because, you know, a single bee can be stupid, but you get a whole hive of bees, this swarm mentality, they can figure out complex issues that are beyond the single bee. So wouldn't it be great if humans could do that? If we could all just get together, we, we could use our combined computing power to solve world problems. Here's the problem. We pride ourselves in being rational thinkers with an inherent sense of morality that guides our actions toward the greater good. These virtues are true uh, across all levels of society, yet collectively, on a global scale, we often make self-destructive decisions. He goes on to say, this begs the question, how can uh, immoral decisions emerge from a society comprised overwhelmingly of moral individuals? Philosophers have been pondering this for ages. Nietzsche lamented madness is rare in individuals, but in groups, political parties, okay, um, nations and eras, it's the rule. And so they go from Nietzsche, they, bring, they jump over to a renowned American theologian, Reinhold Nuremberg, was uh, even more blunt, expressing the group is more arrogant, hypocritical, self-centered, and more ruthless in the pursuit of its ends than the individual. One of the things I learned in the military is you can, you can make sense with an individual. Like if I'm dealing and there's a crisis, I can make sense of an individual. A crowd is stupid. A crowd will turn on you in a minute and kill you. That's why you have to always maintain control. And so this is from the Singularity Institute where they're trying to actually get all the scientists together to bring about the AI singularity. And they say, well, here's what we have learned from the internet. And have anybody ever seen social media go the wrong way? <laughs> I don't mess with it anymore. It's like, you know, there, there's some people that I really love, but uh, <laughs> there's some that is this, it's, it's shown the worst in us because they can't come beat you up, you know? I mean, some, I, I've, had, I've had people say some things to me, either in an email or on a, a social media, that it was face to face, it'd be on, okay? I'll repent later, but there's, there's you know, especially you don't mention Mary Lou in a negative context, it's, it's on, all right? And they, they have the audacity to do that because they're setting a thousand miles away. Usually it's a 45-year-old living in his mama's basement, but let's, let's uh, get on to other things. Um, but it, it, we, we see it in schools that kids begin harassing somebody because there's a bully and all the kids jump in onto the place. The child commits suicide. And so they're saying, how can we have this hive mind without it going bad? And then, so you bring up places like Reddit and everything that people don't realize you have an AI manipulating the conversation to bring out the good, to, to, to gently escort the conversation to get everybody focused on the right things with this premise we can have a hive mind to benefit humanity as long as it is guided by an all-wise AI. I read that and went, oh, no. Because they're, 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 they, they take steps, they're guiding us someplace. 
they want to create a God. And what I eventually believe, we're going to have D-Wave and a lot of these things to come together. I, th I think CERN, and I agree with Anthony Patch, I think CERN has, and, and has two main components that they're doing. Number one, there's a prison that God created that we find in the book of Enoch. That, you know, we, we know that in the book of Enoch, after 70 generations, they were going to begin to be released. I think it's a progressive releasing, but I think that they're not satisfied with that progressive releasing, so they're trying to crack God's prison. And men's hearts will begin to fail for that which comes upon the earth, stuff that he worked to release himself. The other, I believe that, I believe there is no computer, there is no programming on the planet, I don't care if it's D-Wave, Quantum, whatever, whatever else want them that they want to do, I do not believe that it in itself can, re can achieve sentience. But I believe that they can build a construct that a watcher can inhabit and assume its place as a God upon the earth that serves over a digital domain. And so, but you have to have also, if you have a God, you want to be connected to that God. Right? You see, it's an imitation, a poor imitation of what we have in Jesus. The day that you made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life and really got right with him and you weren't playing with him, it wasn't a 30-second prayer. It was, and I, I think we need to let people sit on their knees and cry and squall and ball gut until they get it right. Because we have a lot of sinners get up from the altar and they've not repented, they've responded to an emotional appeal, and they get up a sinner and now they're running churches. That's part of the problem that we're having today. You stay at the altar and you wrestle with God until God touches the hollow of your thigh and you get up and you walk away a different man because your walk has changed. But when you do, the Holy Ghost moves in and you're connected to God. God moved on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit moved on the inside of the aspect of God that is extremely knowable. It empowers everything that he does on planet Earth. Well, they got to imitate that. 5G is more than just your cell phone. You know, they already got plans beyond 5G. I've got an article that I just I finished reading here about a month ago. They said 5G is the first step, and they're already putting the components into 5G for the upgrade. It's called quantum internet. What does that mean? You get at the quantum level, quantum level is perfect for blockchain because with blockchain you're not supposed to be able to hack it the minute that you touch it, it's, your, your, your digital fingerprints are permanently recorded on it and all you need is a little bit of the data of the blockchain, of the blockchain. you can put it on another computer and it will replicate itself to replace all the information that you thought you deleted. And when you look at blockchain, and look it up on Wikipedia, they give, they give uh, a, a Japanese name, which is a pseudonym for the creator of blockchain, but he doesn't exist. And some have said, you know, it's this guy, it's this crew, it's this crew. Many researchers are now beginning to believe that it was AI that developed the concept of blockchain to begin with. And it's going to go well beyond currency. It's blockchaining whoever is digitally connected. But when you begin dealing at, with quantum encryption, quantum encryption goes beyond blockchain. Let's say I'm going, let's say John here has something in, that's quantumly encrypted and I'm going to try to hack it. The moment I reach out and touch it, my blockchain ID is permanently attached to it, and he's immediately notified that I touched his data. Not even that I was able to unencrypt it, because you can't quantum encryption, but you can't even touch it without the owner being immediately notified. And when you get into quantum internet, that means it is going to be, it, it, is, it, it goes beyond the 5G radio waves. It's going to blanket this planet at the quantum level with, with connectivity. That means, that means at the cellular level, everything, I don't know, I don't know if you can set up a, a Faraday cage or not that will block a quantum internet. 
that, and, and you don't have to worry, everybody gets five bars, okay? <laughs> everybody gets a gigabit plus connection. The thing is, when, when you, when, let's go back to the, the diagram I have here. Because I want you to see the full picture. You begin putting it all together. They create a deity. They're moving us toward hive mind, and the only way that they can move us toward hive mind is it has to be AI guided. The transhumanists are going to want to integrate with the AI to their God so that they can be upgraded that we're gonna have a global network that you can't run from, that we're gonna have blockchain, that not only is there a digital currency, you have to be a part of the digital community to be able to buy or sell, and that you can't escape this new universal digital ID, and that all of us beca become the Internet of Things. You see, one of the things that I have pondered is, okay, now when you receive the mark, you can't repent. So it has to be something that completely affects the mind and the will. And I have pondered, is it simply a, a DNA upgrade that once you, you know, they're going to try to make everybody gibberim or Nephilim like, like Nimrod had done. And so does it so change your DNA you're no longer human to, to have the possibility to repent? Because I think there's a threshold that God says, ah, when you go past this, you're no longer human. You don't get to repent. But if we, if we go with an ambiguous interface. That means there are no smartphones. It's embedded right here. That you have access to all the world's knowledge, that you can communicate with anybody anywhere, you can tap into the hive mind, you can share with the wealth of the communication of the world while you're gently being controlled by the AI. Oh, nothing can go wrong with that, right? Well, what did sci-fi tell us? Let me get to the right thing here. Let's see what Jean-Luc Picard says. <laughs> we see in the book of Revelation, they know Jesus is coming back, so his approach, just like we're detecting the burrow, we talked about that at lunch today, and they know it's coming, and we, we have things pointed out into space to detect stuff. They know when he comes that he's coming, so it, how, how that happens, I don't know. Can, can they, you know, does he open up a dimensional portal out by Pluto and work his way in? I don't know. But they know he's coming and they know his wrath is here and they shake their fists at him and curse him knowing that he's coming and getting ready to judge. Why do they do that when they know it's him? It's like, oh, poo, all the Christians were right. Maybe I need to repent. No! Your will has been taken away by the AI. Because, you know, the hive mind can turn ugly within humans, and therefore that ugliness has been suppressed and you brought into, into harmony with this new God. You see, these are some of the things that we're going to face when the Lord come, you know, before the Lord comes back, and then you have the UFO showing up and all kinds of other things. They said, oh, we see you got our present. The AI, that's what we did in Roswell and gave you the components we knew you'd get there. It's a very real possibility. But what I want to deal with is it's time for us to grow up. You see, because all of this is simply a cheap, techno, watcher-based imitation of what we really have possible as believers. But they have purposely kept us in infancy. In fact, they took us out of semi-maturity and dumbed us down to the place that in, in a day that you can do in-depth theological analysis with a push of a button on your computer that you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew, but you can pull up some of the most famous lexicons on the planet in English and research Greek and Hebrew and all the wealth of these things. Biblical illiteracy is at an all-time high in the pulpit. You see, a lot of the stuff that Josh was dealing with, if those preachers would actually open up their Bibles and begin reading it from cover to cover, they would change what they teach.
One of the greatest things that ever happened to me with all my education and everything else was when Mary Lou came out of her bondage, she began to question everything. And so I'd give her the party line of what I was taught in seminary. And she says, oh, really? Show, prove it to me. <laughs> and she would force me. And I said, okay, I have got to exegete the scripture myself. And I'd exegete the scripture myself. And I said, oh, dang, I was wrong. <laughs> when you actually look at the Greek and the Hebrew, that isn't what it says. I don't even know how they got that. There's been a few times I told Mary, I said, I don't know what they were smoking. <laughs> yeah, some of those old theologians with their pipes, you know, in the Reformation, they may not have always been tobacco. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but the apostle Peter saw the day, the last days began on the day of Pentecost after the resurrection of Messiah. We're still in the last days, but turn to your neighbor and say, yeah, but we're in the last of the last of the last days, okay? <laughs> this thing's been winding down for 2,000 years. And he said, this is what was spoken by the prophet uh, Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour my spirit. How's that for internet connectivity? <laughs> Holy Ghost connectivity. I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young man shall see visions, and your old man shall dream dreams. That's why I still see visions. I refuse to acknowledge the fact that I'm getting old. <laughs> I just have nighttime visions while I'm asleep, all right? And on my servants and on my headmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above, and in signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Have we got there yet with that part? You see, Peter was prophesying, saying, this is beginning, and this is where we're heading. And how many know he's talking about where we're getting ready to head? Okay. But then he says, the, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall be blood before the great and uh, notable day of the Lord, which is the, the day of the Lord is the Valley of Armageddon. It's where everybody gets their comeuppance. Okay? So whenever you talk about the day of the Lord, that, that this, the day of his wrath, it's, it's one event. Now, it's, it's memorialized in the day of atonement. That, you know, you have 10 days, 10 days of awe that you're told, okay from the announcements that come with the Feast of Trumpets. You have 10 days to get right with God, get right with man. If you don't humble yourself, you're koshered, you're cut off. And it's a divine rehearsal of the Valley of Armageddon. So he says, we're heading on now, now whosoever shall believe in the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the first part of it, he said, listen, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh and we have replaced the dynamics of the kingdom with the dynamics of religiosity. That we are, we are infantile in our walk in the spirit of God. We don't understand kingdom. We don't, we don't understand. And how many times have believers been deceived because, brother, he said all the right things. Yes, Elmer Gantry can. Now, for those of you that don't know, aren't old enough to know who Elmer Gantry was, he was a character played by Burke Lancaster that was a grifter that began preaching because he saw money in it. Okay? And people will come in, they learn your terminology, they, they say all the right things. And, and I, I have, guys, I had one guy go through our seminary. He had been a minute pastor for years, went through our seminary. Ten years after he graduated, he emailed me and said, while I was sitting in jail, I'm thinking, well, wait, what, what, what? <laughs> Things happened. He got drunk, started taking drugs, ended up in jail. Okay, so you, were, you pastored for 20 years, went to seminary, pastored another 10 years, now you're sitting in jail. And he said, I realized I was never saved. I got saved in prison. I wonder how many times that has been replicated in the church. See, because I'm, I, I, I cannot function in a normal church. I don't do politics. I am so quick to tell you that if you don't like the Word of God, let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Okay, I don't care. <laughs> right before I wrote the Shine Our Directive, I'm sitting there, you know, preaching to my congregation. I said, that's it, I'm done. I'm only going to minister to the remnant. There's the door. And now my door's locked, and I have a private TV studio. 
I don't care about numbers. All I care about is I got a handful of people that I have mentored in my own family, and they, they, the, 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 the harder I preach, the happier they get. I don't have to worry about people manifesting demons or people with DID popping up right in the middle trying to curse me or anything like that. I can just concentrate on ministering the word. And I'm going to deal with the remnant. I don't care where they are in the world. And what I found about the remnant, the more straight shooter you are, the more you become biblical, the more that you teach the word of God, the happier they get. Please stomp on my toes. If, my to you know, if, if, I, if I let the devil get my toes out in the out, please stomp on them. Let me know before he cuts them off, please. We, we need to change our dynamics in the last days. It's not what the guy says, it's what the guy does. It's the spirit of the man. I've been around the world and what I've done in ministry, and I have been in places that neither one of us spoke the same language. But what I could sense was Jesus. What I could sense was the kingdom. And I knew it was a brother. Or I knew it was a sister, or he was a sister in the Lord. Sometimes at the airport, if you really become sensitive to the things of the kingdom of God because you have returned back to the basics, disciplines of the faith, and it starts with spending time in the word, you got to get back into kingdom programming because it's got to erase the programming of Babylon that you spent your whole life being programmed by the world into and have your brains washed by the water of the word. And quit arguing with the word. I was amazed at this fact. No matter how much education I have, I have discovered God's always right and I'm always wrong. <laughs> You know, anymore, you know, God will deal with me with something, and I'll start arguing with God, and God says, really, we're still there? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so which of my old teachings do I need to delete from the Internet? <laughs> you know? we're, we're supposed to do this and approach God with meekness. There's things that we see in the book of Acts that should be commonplace in the church. The book of Acts does not have an end. And with every epistle, there, you can sense there's a winding down of it. You know there's coming to a close because you know, the apostle Paul or Peter or whatever, they have wound up with the things, they, they, they have finished their argument, their discussion or whatever. And with Paul, it's like Jeopardy. You've got to figure out the question before you can understand the book. Amen? Because he was writing epistles. He learned from Gamaliel. And it was Gamaliel would be given a problem. He would pray, research scripture, and he would give them an answer via an epistle. That's where the apostle Paul got the idea. And so you have to figure out the question to understand what he told you. And so as, as, you, as you begin doing these things and, and learning these things, the book of Acts does not have a conclusion because we're still walking in it. But we've not been told that. And I, and I, I was raised missionary Baptist. I surrendered at a missionary Baptist altar. I tell people I'm Bapticostal with a good twist of Hebraic heritage. I'm kind of like that swirly ice cream, you know. And what I, you know, what I was taught is, you know, we need to get back to the book of Acts. And, 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 and every, that's what everybody always says, but they forget two components of the book of Acts. We're getting ready to get back there today. They became a minority. They were a minority. And they were persecuted. What I have found is tribulation will push you into places that you normally wouldn't go. Brother Mike... What did it take you to begin celebrating the feast and then to celebrate the Sabbath? I had people trying to kill me. I had witches trying to kill me. And everything I had was blowing up. Two years or two or five years earlier, I, I was invited to a colloquium by Dr. John Gar. They had scholars from around the world teaching on Hebraic heritage. They loved on me. I took all the materials, and when I really wanted to sound cool, I would borrow something. You want to hear something mysterious out of, out of Hebraic concepts? Let me razzle-dazzle. You know, I'd pull something out. This is what Dr. Dwight Pryor said or, or Marv Wilson or some of the others, you know, and it'd it make me sound very profound, you know. 
but yeah, then put it back on the shelf. But when the prophecy started hitting the fan in my life, and I had witches get in my face. You see, we can debate this thing about, you know, Christmas and all this stuff. For me, it's a matter of spiritual warfare. And I don't share this very often because it, it's, you, people want to fight. And I, don't, I don't fight. I just live it and there's proof. I had witches get in my face that we got you this year. Because you're going to do Christmas. That's a violation of Torah. And I'm saying, T -t to what? And that's our holiday. And we're going to be able to, it's going to open a door to us. And we're going to get you. And oh, by the way, we have witches attend Christmas and Easter services all over the world. They pull that psychic violation from those congregations so they can use it to attack those congregations the rest of the year. And they're actually very blatant about it. They, they call us thieves. And my wife, I mean, we, we had a Christmas room in our house, okay? My wife burned up and she says, I'll show you why, Jack. I'm going to show you some power because everybody in the world is going to be talking about Jesus. We got sicker than we ever got in our life. Everything I owned started breaking down, falling apart. Uh, guys, I would bring stuff home from Walmart, open up the box, and it'd go, Bleh. I go, I've had about enough of this. So I went to the Lord, and he said, well, he said, they, they told you the truth, and you were too arrogant. Now you research it. I researched it. And I said, okay, that's it. We're going we're gonna to go back to the biblical feasts. They're all about Jesus anyway. Every one of them is about Jesus. And if you're doing it and Jesus isn't the epicenter of it, you're, you're doing it wrong. Okay? And some Christians thought I was weird. The occult got livid over it. They got mad because I shut in my life one of the major doors they used. And then they had to try, you know, and... Uh, I'm, I'm very sensitive about a lot of things. Like for me, I will not use a Star of David because it's also a hexagram that was used by the occult long before the Jewish people ever used it. And there's debate about even how they used it. And so I don't use it. And I don't use a Star either because I don't need a Pentapha or a Baphomet, either one. And, but, here, here's, and, but here's what Ozark occultists do. Okay, now Ozark occultists. Anybody from the Ozarks? Okay. I know Mike Lakes of the devil because I saw him the other day with an upside down star of David on his t-shirt. If you can get that bad boy upside down and know it's upside down instead of right up, you're, you're a better man than me. We, we have all these, so for me it's a matter of spiritual warfare. I return to publicity because I had people trying to kill me. They had assassins after us. They harassed us. They sabotaged our vehicles. Mary and I have been poisoned. We've this over and over and over things, again, that God supernaturally delivered us from. I, I've seen God pick up a semi, pick it up like a Tonka truck, and set it back on the right side of the road so it wouldn't wipe us off the road. I've been on chases on the highway, and I, I feel like I'm in one of those Born Identity movies, you know, when, but not with a broke-down minivan, okay? <laughs> and Mary says, wait, wait, wait. And we get right to the exit, and we dive off the exit. A car stops in the passing lane and backs up on a four-lane highway to go back after us. I said, okay, it's on now. I'm going to get all these four cylinders, and we're going, baby, you know. <laughs> Me, Jesus, and four cylinders, and here we go. And God supernaturally delivered us time and time again. There were times when you, when you begin experiencing the peace of God. The Bible says, let the peace of God be your empire, but we never do anything to become familiar with the peace of God. It only comes in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and Mary and I, when we began studying and stuff in the Sabbath, you know, you begin lighting the two candles and all this stuff. I said, let's give it a try. You know, I've not been big for ceremony or anything else. And so we gather, we light the two candles and pray, and the Holy Ghost came in and filled the place where I'm thinking, if I could have this in the service, we, we'd have a thousand people here. This, God made a point. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to do this, you know, because God was trying to get our attention. And once I, I got used to that peace, when it began to be pulled back, Okay, something's wrong. 
we're going up to, to meet somebody and God just takes our peace. It's like Mary and I start squirming in our seat in the car and we're supposed to be there for dinner in 20 minutes and I'm squirming and I'm not late. And she says, I can't take it. Turn around the exit call. I'm, I'm gonna call him, tell him we can't come. We go off the exit, go back on, begin going on the highway. As soon as we get on the highway, going the other way, state patrol pulls us over and thinking, man, I didn't even get up to 45 yet. And, and there's, a, there's a black sports car that he, that he, this guy is screaming at the guy. And then comes up and says, did you see him? No, well, he was heading at, at, your, at you at 105 miles an hour. You see, following the peace of God, God put us in a place. How many know that guy didn't drive off after that? They probably ended up carting him off to jail. And then he went back and started screaming at the guy as we drove off. We didn't wait to see what, but, but because we, we, we sensed the peace of God being pulled back, we corrected ourselves and said, okay, we're not going here because God is telling us something is wrong. It was a setup. We were supposed to die. And because we obeyed the peace of God, God had that state trooper there and nailed him before he could get to us. Because in a minivan, you clip the back corner, but we go tumbling at 70 miles an hour on the highway. Bad news for us. But God was there. You see, God is there. We, we, we see things in the book of Acts of people having visions of people being teleported. Come on. He, did, he didn't wait for Uber to show up to take him to go talk to the man. It's this, I'm here, I'm there. And it's still happening today. I've got reports of a man in Texas, and this was back in the, in the 80s. He's an oil man. And he gets ready to step off a rig, and when he sets his foot down, he's in the jungles of Africa. How many know that's a rude awakening? <laughs> and there's a young black man there that is crying out to know Jesus, and so he shares Jesus with him, leads him to the Lord, and when he turns to walk away, he's back on Texas mud. Wow. And so he's an oil man. He looks at his cowboy boots and says, that ain't Texas mud. Has it analyzed? It's and there are components in it indigenous to Africa. 20 years later, he goes to Africa on a missionary trip, and this, he said the strapping uh, black man that was a preacher come up and running to him, and he said, I've been waiting all these years to thank you for sharing Jesus with me in the middle of the jungle. Those are the kind of things we're going to begin walking in. I'm not looking to astral project when you can portal. I've got one I'm still trying to wrap my head around because what I'm trying to do is build your faith, okay? I'm up in Canada ministering the gospel up at Kevin Tabucci's church, and I'm staying at his house, and I call Mary's kind of sick and stuff and and I don't ever like being away from home and, and she thought she was running a fever and and all this stuff and so I'm up in the middle of the night I'm praying I'm, I'm just agonizing over this I'm a thousand miles away I'm all the way up in Saskatchewan you know it, it's in, in in the winter time when just passing the coffee out the Tim Hortons window into the cab of the truck and the coffee's cold 35 below zero. It ain't right, okay? So I'm up there, and, and, and I am completely aware that I'm still laying in that bed, in that bedroom, and at the same time, I'm walking through my house at nighttime. And it's not a vision. I can, I'm barefoot because I was in, in, in bed with my pajamas on. I can feel the carpet in the, between my toes. I can smell my house. I walk, through, I walk through the house at, at night, and I, you know, mind you, it's almost like a maze, but I, I know it, and I walk through it, and there's moonlight on Mary, I, and I, I, could, I even told her the top she wore to bed that night, that she's there, I lay hands on her and pray, she never wakes up, just, you know, <laughs> women snore sweetly, right? That's right. Amen. And uh, I lay hands on her, I, I can smell her, Okay. There, you know, the, your, your wife has a scent. It is part of the, the feeling of home. And it, all my senses are involved. The minute I quit praying, I'm no longer there. And at the whole time this is going on, I am still aware that I'm laying in that bed. I'm not astral projecting. I don't know what it was. 
I called her the next morning. She said, the fever broke in the night. I'm doing fine this morning. You see, those are the things that are possible for us if we'll believe. But how do we get there? How do we get there? Can I, can I spend 20 minutes dealing on the, the how-to? I remember Brother Copeland years ago back in, in the charismatic movement. And I, I was part of the charismatic movement since about 78, okay? I remember when Kenneth Copeland was a young whippersnapper. And I was wet behind my ears. I had waterfalls going on. And he taught, you know, the just shall live by faith. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from the faith message. Brother Henry, I mean, he is, he is the epitome of learning how to live by faith. But there's a component of faith. Faith, we think, is just believing God for great big things. That is a component of faith. That we're doing things for God. God always calls us to do that which we're not able to do without him. If you could do it by yourself, God didn't call you to do it. God always does that because we must be dependent upon him. But the apostle Paul in Romans, when he said, the just shall live by faith, he was quoting Habakkuk. And so I went back to see what Paul was quoting. And in Habakkuk, it does say, but the just shall live by faith. But I looked up the Hebrew. Em unah. And I probably have it wrong. Rabbi will tell me here in a little bit. I speak Ozarkian Hebrew, okay? <laughs> the just shall live by his fidelity to the covenant. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There are two sides of faith. Believe in God for the impossible and be faithful to the covenant that he gave me in the word. And the more that I am faithful to the covenant, the more my faith works on this side, the greater things that I can do because I am faithful to him no matter what and I will not move from covenant. And you don't learn your fidelity during the good times. You learn them during the hard times. How many of us have been through some of them? Rabbi shared some of the hard times he went through, but because he would not deny the name of Yeshua, he was being tested his fidelity to the covenant. And when he proved himself faithful, how I many know God knew what he was going to do before he did, but you want to know the truth? I think a lot of times we go through it so that we convince ourselves of the deepest part of our man, our, our spirit, that we will remain faithful. And now it's not a matter of temptation. I, don't, I, don't, I do not violate covenant. No, I don't violate covenant with God. I will not vi violate covenant with my wife. Boy, a preacher would, would just learn that all the scandal stuff and quit. You're in covenant. You're in covenant. You do not break covenant. You will give up your life before you break covenant. You will give up your life before you deny the name Jesus. And you will give up your life before you break covenant with your mate. Because you stood before the altar of God and said, this is forever. And I, I've done a few wedding ceremonies. I don't do a lot, but I tell them, I say, if you ever break it, I will hunt it down to enforce it. <laughs> Serious about covenant. How do you want to walk in greater faith? Be faithful. He who is faithful over little shall become a ruler over much. And you have to be faithful. Brother Henry has been faithful wherever God's called him to do. And I mean, leaving your family behind all the time. I tell him, you know, I, I love doing the conference to you, but at the same time, I'm miserable. I'm miserable. I can't sleep. I left my teddy bear up in Missouri. She's about five, six. Come on now. That's the way it's supposed to be. But I'm, I'm faithful. He was faithful to do what God told him to do. And that is the reason. In fact, I think one of the reasons that uh, right now God is having Henry, and I felt this down in Branson, God, you know, he's kind of doing the circuit. We have a whole new generation that needs to hear the stories because their generation is going to be required to walk in it, and they have not seen it from us. Come on. 
My generation, the generation before us, we have messed up bad. We let them take prayer out of school. Now they're shooting in schools. There should have been riots in the streets. The day that they approved abortion, it was time to abort the Supreme Court. Oh, no, they just, and you know, the Supreme Court does not make law. Listen to me, they do not make law, they give an opinion. And there's a lot of things being forced today in America as law that Congress has yet to pass one law on. I read where one minister that teaches all the time on the Constitution stuff, he was, he was touring the Supreme Court, and the tour guy said, and this is where laws are made. He said, excuse me, what's that big dome building over there? What do they do? Boy, she didn't like that question. Because this is where we, no, you don't make law there. They don't have the power to enforce law. They give a legal opinion. Oh, that's a whole different subject. What template do we go to? I call this the Cornelius template. We're, we, we need to position ourselves for sudden, sustained, powerful movements of God. Okay? They do not happen by happenstance. Hear me. They are not random. They only spring forth on fertile ground. Cornelius was a Roman soldier. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius the Centurion, and he was in a rock band called the Italian Band. Now, <laughs> he was in an all-Roman or all-Italian Roman band, which was 555 infantrymen and 66 cavalrymen, and he commanded, I think it's like 50 or so, was what a centurion is over. So he was a man of stature of a larger one, and they were all true, true Romans. They weren't mercenaries. He was a citizen of Rome, born, raised a Roman citizen. Okay? A devout man. Underline this and you're about devout. You want to be ready for the next move of God and for it to be sustained in your life? Devout has to be a part of the nomenclature of who you are. I think every generation is touched by the fire of God. But what we have never been taught is once the fire has come, it is our responsibility to keep it burning by our fidelity to the covenant. He was a devout man, one that feared God. Let me tell you something. Every time I get in the pulpit, I'm, I'm nervous. You say, Mike, you should be able to do this stuff in your sleep. Yes, you can throw a Bible at me in the middle of the night. I will set up in the bed, grab the Bible in midair, and wherever it opens up, I can preach out of it. That's not the problem. This is a sacred desk. When I get behind this desk, I am no longer speaking for Mike Lake. I am speaking for Almighty God. And one day I will have to stand before him and give an account of what I have spoken. And if I can't speak it out of the fear of God, I better go home. That's level one of the understanding of this. The second understanding to tie into what Josh was talking about, it's a term called a God fear. A God fear was a Gentile. He's a Roman soldier. He's a centurion. He's commanding a hundred men or whatever. But he has denied the gods of Rome. He turned his back on paganism. He's now serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's keeping kosher, he's keeping the feasts, he's keeping the Sabbath. When he's able to get up to Jerusalem, he's in the Gentile court worshiping. That is what a God fear is. A God fear does it all except he never was circumcised to become physically a Jew because it would have probably cost him and his family their status and everything else within Rome. And so he was a God fear. He did everything up to the point of becoming physically Jewish, and the synagogues were full of them. That's why the Apostle Paul would go into a synagogue and he would first preach to the Jews, 
And then he would preach to the Gentiles about a greater circumcision, the circumcision of the heart that was only available through Messiah. Sounds like a good deal. Circumcision sounds rough when you're a grown man, okay? Circumcision of the heart is better. But let me tell you something. We have a lot of believers today that claim to be believers, but their heart has never been circumcised. Because once it's circumcised, everything that flows out of your heart is in line with covenant. Because everything you reproduce in your life comes from your heart. So he feared God with all his house, so his faith, his faith affected all the Roman citizens living in his home. His wife rejected the paganism rejected the mystery religions and was serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he gave much psalms to the people. And he prayed to God always. That's the template that you are devout in your walk with God. We have got to make our spirituality first place in our lives. We are people of the word we are people that have faith actions because faith, faith without works is dead. If you believe the word, you do acts of righteousness. Sometimes it can be getting in a semi and taking water to people through, un, un, you know, we, we heard during lunch all the things that, that, that what, Cajun Army? That's faith. I serve Jesus. Jesus wants to help. I got a truck. Let's go, Jesus. And the Lord was behind him every step. And he'll tell you, it wasn't me. I got out of the way and it was Jesus. That's the way it's supposed to be. We, we have to be people that are devout in our faith. The word of God is true. I'm wrong. Anytime there's a disagreement between me and the word, I lose. Quick to repent. Quick to correct. That I, the, the apostle James says, we need to approach the word with humility so that it can be engrafted in us. As it's engrafted in us, it changes us. And we have, to, we have to have devotion and motion in the kingdom once again. That we've got to fear God once again. You know, I love, I love Mike and Jeannie to death. But if I'm preaching the word and they get offended at me and, and ask me never to come back, I won't give it a second thought. Because I won't change my message to make anybody happy. That's the one of the things that I've learned. <laughs> Unlike the modern mega church that looks at all of these statistics and, and demographics, well, the demographics can be wrong because they're all sinners. Amen. Come on now. You speak the truth because you're representing God. God judged the Levites in Malachi, which actually opened up for the whole concept of rabbis. Malachi, was ju or, or Malachi judged the Levites because they quit teaching the people what they needed to hear and started teaching them what they wanted to hear. And they violated the covenant that Levi had with God. And we can say, oh yeah, these Jews this, those, these Jews that. The church is just as guilty, if not more, in our era than they were during the book of Malachi. Because if we don't teach the people what they want, they'll leave and they'll take their pocketbooks with them. Don't build something that you can't keep going if you're faithful to God because it was never God's to begin with. I believe every ministry should try its best to run debt free. I'm finally to the place where we are, glory to God. It took a lot of planning, a lot of prayer, and and a lot of different things, and, and I'm going to try my best. I am never going to go outside of what I can write a check for because I'm never going to, I, I never want that pressure of, boy, you know, God's given me this to preach, and, and I, I know i got a mortgage payment coming up. And boy, if I preach that, it may, I may have to go back into my banker. I, I made everybody mad, and, and they all left, and I got, I got $10. Can you imagine the pressure of that? And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking down. I'm, I'm, I'm empathizing with them for the pressure. Some ministries, because of the staff and salaries and everything else, just to keep the doors open, they have to bring in a million dollars a month. And if you don't, lights go off, 
Families don't get fed. People don't have health insurance. There's a lot of pressure with that. But man, if you can get it to where you operate in God's kingdom and, and don't build what you can't pay for. And that way there's not that pressure there because we got to stay faithful to what God tells us to do. And we have to walk in this fear of God. God notices your giving, and this is alms, this is not the tithe. This was giving to the poor, those in need above the tithe. And later on, when the angel showed up, he says, heaven took notice of your alms. Heaven took notice of what you gave above the tithe because you just saw somebody in need and you had money in your pocket and you gave it to them and you forgot about your need. That gets God's attention. How many know we're called to be givers? And it's not because it's a lottery. We're not involved in Amway. Just put it in you. Come on. And some of them have taught it that way. I believe in the hundredfold return, but it doesn't have to be Ferraris. And to be, God, I'm older, okay? We don't need a Porsche. We will kill ourselves. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt get an SUV that is builteth like a tankist. Because we know it's the way you drive us, okay? We need to begin learning and in that devoutness to God. Watchman E talked about it's, it's in his book called The Releasing of the Spirit. Watchman, he had some really neat ideas. Oh, that's Oriental. Let me tell you something. The Semitic Hebraic mindset is an Eastern mindset, not a Western mindset. Many times the Oriental mindset of people like that from China that discovered Jesus is closer to the mindset of Paul than we are. When Watchman, he talked about authority, he goes all the way, he goes all the way back to the fall of man and... and, and it hit something in the garden I never saw before. He said, when man was given the knowledge of good and evil, what it gave is man the ability to tell God, you're not going to choose what's good and evil. I will. Kind of screams off the headlines today, don't you think? You see, only God can declare what's right and what's wrong. And he, he writes, he said, listen, when we, when we get saved... The problem is it's, it's like we're, we're a mini tabernacle, okay? Outer court, inner court, you know, the holy place. And then our spirit man is the holy of holies where, where, where the throne of God is. Our problem is that curtain has never been ripped open. <laughs> There's this big crusty area that, that's blocking your spirit from moving from your soul. We're like, we have like crusty barnacles, matey, over all of us because of the deep seas that we've been going into and, and how rough life was. And part of the breaking of learning to humble ourselves before God and breaking is God begins to break that shell so that we're no longer living by our soul, but we're living by our spirit. Because it's your spirit, man, that's connected to the third heaven where the throne of God is, and you begin sensitive to what God is saying, you become sensitive. If, if we had that kind of discernment, there'd be no more charlatans in the church. I don't care what you say. I don't care about the Rolex on your, on your arm, or sometimes they'll get an old beat up, you know, Timex, or, a, you know, just go, go the other end. And you say all the right things, and, and I, I have known people in the Pentecostal movement that everybody thought was saved, and their deacons in the church and everything else, and they got the Holy Ghost, and they just know how to shimmer and shake and use the language. No discernment. And they walk up, and they're, I'm doing this for the Lord, and I'm doing that for the Lord. You want to say, you can't do anything for the Lord because you're not even part of his kingdom. You've just, you've just learned the lingo, and you've learned the mannerisms, and you've learned the politics of what we call church. If we had discernment by the Spirit, I, guys, I, I've been in airports, and I'm thinking, I sense a believer here, and it feels familiar. I did that one time up in, I was, I was over in, in New York, I can't remember if it was LaGuardia, so I, I just hunted down the feeling. There was Dr. Roger Sapp, one of my graduates, and we had a great conversation. I didn't know he was going to be in, in there, in there and I, I just sensed in my spirit. How many times has Henry Gruber 
that God, you know, he gets into a situation and God says, don't go there. Okay, I won't. That if he would have, he, he could have had presumptuous faith and got killed. Or when was the last time you had enough faith in God, you looked at a guy with a gun in your face and said, you can't kill me, I'm already dead. We need to capture the attention and the imagination of this generation. What well, gives me hope, and I'm going to end with this because I've got 30 seconds left. But I still, somebody stole my 20 minutes. Um, what made my day, what made my day, Xander, was when you told me about your son. For 40 years, I've argued with aspirants of the ministry because they didn't want to read, they didn't want to study. They argued with me about the word. Well, that won't preach. Stuff you're trying to do won't preach either as far as heaven is concerned. How many have read the, uh, the Shiner Directive? Okay. Eight-year-old son has read both my books, highlighted and sticky-noted out the kazoo, and then talks to his mentor and says, Dr. Lake said this on page 25. What do you think about this? And he also said this on page 125. And the guy's saying, you know what? I need to read that book and catch up with him. <laughs> that gave me hope. Because I don't know what this is going to look like in 10 years. Come on. Now, Josh Tolley will be in his prime. My prime has been way back in my, my rearview mirror, you know. I don't know if I'll be able to preach in 10 years. You don't know. It's going to, what I'm sensing in my spirit, and, and any of us that are over 50, if you're younger than 40, you're getting ready to be handed the torch in the kingdom. And God's getting ready to give you a fire that he's going to require you to keep the fire burning and then to give it to the next generation and say, make it blaze even more. Amen. So walking in the supernatural has got to be as common to us as breathing for the next generation to get it. Because everything with the AI and this connectivity and everything else is a cheap imitation of what we're going to have in the Soviet Union they were able to flip many ministers to become communists but there's one group they couldn't do it Pentecostals because when they would begin torturing them or do the brainwashing the dudes would start speaking in tongues and they knew it was over you can't flip this one because although they could try to affect the mind, they couldn't affect the spirit. And they would just send them out into the work camps. You know how in Soviet Union, you know how you found out where church was? And for them, they, they, it wasn't you know, Sabbath or Sunday. It's we're going to meet one day this week. And it's going to be a different time every week and a different location every week. And here's how you find out to make sure you're not KGB. You pray, God shows you, you show up, you're a believer. Seeing that happen in China, same thing. Howard Carter, the one that taught Lester Summer all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, he could hold his own against the Dalai Lama, an adept in black arts. He's running around on pace, 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 you know. He is an adept in the mystery religions. And him and Howard Carter would go up and they would actually camp out where the Dalai Lama lives and everything and debate them and hold their own and begin reading their mail and everything else. And they would go a certain way each day. And Howard Carter said, today we're not going that way. There's bandits there, the Lord showed me. So we're going to go this way. We're going to be safe. He knew how to move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When he met Lester Sumrall in America, Lester Sumrall was about 18, 19 years old. Brother Carter, I'd like to go with you on the mission field. Great. I'm going to be in Australia. See you there. It took him six months to get his passport, raise the funds, and get there. The whole time he's on the ship, I don't know where he is. I don't know where to telegraph him. I don't know anything. How in the world am I? Australia is a big place. 
So he, he's walking down the, the off-ramp on the boat or whatever they call it, okay? I'm not a, a, I was Army. I don't know about this Navy stuff. He, he was walking down the ramp, and the guy greets him, big smile on his face. Brother Lester, I'm here to fetch you. Howard Carter sent me down here to fetch you. He told me you were going to be on this boat, and you'd get off right now. And I knew exactly what you were wearing because he told me, come on, let's go. <laughs> That's the gifts of what's available. It's not for the super-powered preacher that tries to act like a Gnostic and he gets all, whoa! <laughs> Have you ever seen him? Oh, God, a prophetic word. <laughs> Spurgeon moved in words of, of prophetic words and words of knowledge in the middle of his preaching and never missed a beat, and they thought it was in his notes. And here's another one for all you Pentecostals. I've seen people move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit that never spoke in tongues. Because where we have made it an initial sign, it was initial on the day of Pentecost. It was initial at Cornelius' home because it had to be to get their attention because they thought the Gentiles were as filthy as pigs and were unredeemable until they became physically Jews. And God got Peter's attention and proved it by a many day of Pentecost at Cornelius' home. And so he goes back and says, dude, it was like it was with us. I can't argue with God. But the Apostle Paul asked, asked directly, does everybody speak in tongues? He wouldn't have asked that if everybody did. And too many in the Pentecostal movement, see, I get everybody. You get a toe out. That's turning yellow now. Okay, I'm going to finish with this. I've got to. We have sought tongues. We have sought an experience and not a person. And I have seen many that spoke in tongues that never did a thing for God the rest of their life. They never moved in a gift. They never did anything, but they could rondai shandai with the best of them. But I have seen people that when they prayed, they may, they may stammer and they may cry and a lot of things, and I think that's their form of praying in the Spirit. But they, they would move heaven. They would have people healed. They would move in the wisdom of God, and they would move in the supernatural, and the Pentecostals wouldn't know how to grit it because you couldn't rondai shandai. Quit putting God in a box. Yeah. I've said all that to say this. Be devout. Press into God until your wife no longer needs a nightlight because you be glowing at night. And learn the voice of God and learn how to move in God. And it should be so natural that your children to begin moving in it because it's a common place in their household. It becomes natural to them to walk in the supernatural because that generation, if the Lord tarries, is going to need it. Father God, I ask in the name of Jesus that for the men that you would release the spiritual testosterone that we would become men of God, that we would dare believe the word, that we would dare be men of prayer, and that we would dare to be obedient to the God of the universe. And Father, I pray for every woman that her heart as a mother and as a woman would come into balance and that she would dare to seek the heart of God. And that her relationship with God would so deepen that when God's heart beats, her heart beats. And Father, let the older men teach the younger men. Let the older women teach the younger women how to love and how to obey covenant and how to walk with God and how to walk in the supernatural. And Father, I ask that if we're, if we're wrong in an area, that you would correct us, that you would wake us up with dreams, that you would take away our peace until the correction is established and we're back on the path that we need to be on because you desire to use us more than we desire to be used. Give us a fresh anointing for obedience, a fresh anointing to be empowered to carry the fire of God in a world that's spiraling out of control in darkness, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.